Hey guys, welcome to today's episode of The Law of Self-Defense. Thank you for joining us. I am, of course, attorney Andrew Branca. Thank you, thank you. And uh, we're here today to talk with a very special guest, Dr. Marcus Funk, uh, who I hope will be joining us. <laughs> he's, not, he's not here yet. Um, and it's, uh, it's going to be a pretty short show if uh, Dr. Funk can't make it. He is a very busy guy, as you might imagine. Uh, so it's possible something might have come up, although he just emailed me a, a short while ago. So I'm hoping, I'm hoping everything is uh, going to work out okay. Uh, and we're here, of course, to talk about a paper he had written on self-defense that just over a month ago, about five weeks ago, I critiqued. Whoop. Oh, let's see. I think, I think he might have the wrong link. Let's see. Um, let me send him a quick email. I may have sent him the wrong guest link. Let me take a look. There is that. And this, try it again. I'm sure it was my fault. Uh, so a paper of Dr. Funk's that I had critiqued about five weeks ago, um, perhaps a bit more harshly. Uh, <laughs> in hindsight, because uh, I didn't know Dr. Funk at the time of the critique. I uh, never imagined we'd uh, we'd actually meet in purpose uh, in person. He works uh, <laughs> multiple pay grades above me uh, in the legal profession, and uh, uh, but lo and behold, uh, somehow he got word of my critique of his paper, and he reached out to me, and he was very kind and not at all defensive. Uh, we had a great conversation over the phone, and then we met for lunch a couple weeks later. I uh, had a great conversation at lunch, and he agreed to come on the show and uh, have us do uh, an, another view of the paper, uh, this time with his personal participation, um, which I think is very helpful. And, uh, and it's also the case that the, uh, I guess the version of the paper I had critiqued was kind of an early release draft. And uh, uh, now the final version is out. And there, there have, um, uh, well, one, there's been some uh, corrections or clarifications on things I had critiqued. Uh, two, there are some things reading it a second time that I critiqued where I think my critique was really, it was unfair. Perhaps I misread it the first time around. I have to confess, I, I wasn't giving it a ton of effort. It was just show content. Uh, it's not like I was reviewing it for a case. And uh, um, so there's a kind of a mixed bag of that stuff. There's still things I would have done differently in the paper, as you might imagine. Uh, particularly the uh, elements of self-defense. and um, But my elements of self-defense are, of course, the framework I'm most comfortable with. Uh, there's reasonable people can have alternative views on what can work. I don't... Whoop, whoop, whoop. All right, folks. So... Uh, Dr. Funk is in the background. Let me do the official, uh, well, I guess I already did the official kind of show start. I'll just bring on Dr. Funk, and here we go. Hey, doctor, how are you? Can you hear me? Oh, we can't hear you. There's uh you're not muted on my end. So you Hello, should. No. Oh, there. All right. Now I can hear you. Perfect. Good to be with you, Andrew. Great to have you on. I can't tell you how much I appreciate it. First of all, a little, a little complimentary applause. There you go. 
Thank you very much. We don't we don't have guests very often, uh, but I'm I'm blessed when we do have guests. They tend to be uh, very high quality, <laughs> so it's uh, it's always humbling to have uh, have you folks on the show. And I was just recounting to the audience uh, how it was we came to meet. You had written this paper, I guess it was kind of in an early release draft form, discussing self defense. Uh, I have a long history of not thinking much of academic papers. I need to show content, so I took yours and I did a critique on the show. Uh, I, I just re-listened to my critique earlier today <laughs> to refresh my recollection. And while I, I to my credit, I, I did say it's far better than most of the academic literature out there on self-defense. Uh, I did use the word sloppy a lot more than I would have in, in hindsight. But in any case, I never imagined that we would have the opportunity to meet in person. Uh, but somehow you came across that critique. You reached out to me. We had a phone conversation about it. You were... Uh, in my experience, when I critique other people, especially lawyers' work, they tend to get extremely defensive and hostile, and there, were, there was absolutely none of that from you. You were very open, very transparent, a very pleasant conversation. Then we met for lunch a couple of weeks later, uh, and very nice conversation at lunch, and you agreed to come on the show, which is, well, of course, where we are today. Um, now, the first thing I'll caution you, Doctor, is uh, don't pay any attention to the, to, the, to the chat or the comments, if you can see that, because there's lunatics in there. And... Uh, uh, I don't have all that much control over over what they write. So uh, just ignore them. Um, and before we jump in, I'd like to share with my audience your bio so they have a sense of who you are, where you're coming from. So this is right from your paper. I won't read the whole thing, but the important parts up front. Uh, Marcus Funk, PhD, former federal prosecutor, U.S. State Department Section Chief, Kosovo, taught criminal comparative law, at, among other law schools, Northwestern, University of Chicago, University of Colorado, which I believe is where you are now, uh, and Oxford University, author of several books, including this book. We'll talk more about this in a moment. V thank you very much for this. I really appreciate it. Um, and uh, a bunch of articles, including the one we'll cover today, and also a partner here in uh, Denver at Perkin Coy. All that stuff. And these, uh, as I mentioned to my audience when I critiqued your paper, these are credentials that are vastly uh, superior to anything I could bring to the table. So it's uh, we're, we're humbled to have you on board here for today's show. Well, Andrew, really, uh, really appreciate it. Appreciate the opportunity. I see you already outdressed me. So I'm already <laughs> fighting from a deficit here. Um, and I'll, uh, I'll do my best to ignore the, the comments. Although in my line of business, uh, current and past, um, critique is not something that we shy away from. In fact, that's one of the reasons I reached out to you which is um, obviously your, your, your I, I, I really appreciate it, as I told you, the time that you spent going through the, uh, the articles sort of line by line. Um, and, and while uh, you were not uh, hyper impressed by a lot of what you read, I, I appreciated the time you, you spent on it. And I thought it would be interesting to kind of walk through it again and talk about it and see where maybe we're on the same page, maybe we're on different pages. And, and um, I hope that, uh, that your viewers, listeners will um, will not be bored by by this excursion into a little bit more self defense theory, moral theory, but not. We'll try to keep it, you know, at a, at a light enough level that it's interesting for all of us, including the two of us. Well, the audience here should be particularly interested in the self defense stuff, since this is the the law self defense community. Yeah. So I, I trust we'll get a lot of. I've been hearing a lot of excitement from people waiting for the show. Cool. They've been asking me because after we had lunch, I, I had mentioned you'd be coming on, and they keep asking me when when you're going to be here. Uh, so and now it's. We're finally at that. We are day. at the starting gate. Okay. Uh, so, but before I get to the the high quality substance here, I do have a, a commercial obligation. Uh, today's content is sponsored by none other than, well, than me. Uh, the Law of Self Defense. We have one of our uh, rare Law of Self Defense full day courses coming up on Saturday, April fifteenth. That's next Saturday, folks. So there's only four days left. Four days left to sign up. This is the full day course where we teach you how to be hard to convict, to be an unattractive target of prosecution. If you're ever compelled to use force in defense of yourself, your family, your property, it's a live course, full day course, live, taught by me personally, streamed to you at your computer, plenty of opportunity for Q&A. Learn more about the course and more important, sign up. This is the only one we have scheduled for the year, folks. Sign up, learn more, sign up at lawofselfdefense.com slash advanced. Uh, and I also want to mention... Uh, where is it? Dr. Funk's book, this book, Rethinking Self-Defense. I have to confess, I haven't had a chance to read it, but I've had a chance to flip through it. 
and it's quite impressive. It's uh, really, really impressive. I can't wait to have an opportunity to read the whole thing. I, I put a, I'll put this up again as we get further into the show. So as people are more impressed by your work and they'll be more inclined to get the book. Uh, this is just a redirect to Amazon, folks. But if you go to lawofselfdefense.com slash funk, uh, it'll redirect you to the Amazon site for this book. And it's really very good. Uh, I don't know if the Amazon site offers the opportunity to kind of view pages inside the book. Sometimes that's a, that's a thing. I think it does, yeah. But if it does, I would encourage you to do that, folks, because I think you'll be really impressed. And uh, maybe perhaps someday after I've had a chance to read the book, uh, Dr. Funk would be willing to come back on and we can talk about portions of it because it looks really fascinating. It's a much more... Um, academic, and I don't mean that in a, a derogatory sense, I mean that in a, a sense of deep thought um, view of this area of the law that I typically have the opportunity to take myself. So I found it really very interesting. Uh, let's see. So is there anything else I need to take care of? Oh, as, uh, as usual, folks, if you'd like to pose questions for either myself or Dr. Funk, uh, that's great. Uh, but if you're watching this on YouTube, those questions need to be in the form of a, you guessed it, a $5 minimum super chat. And the, the higher the dollar the value, the more likely we'll get to the question. Uh, same on uh, Rumble, needs to be a $5 Rumble rant. Let's make sure everything is streaming the way it should be. Uh, and, uh, or if you're a Law of Self-Defense member, just ask your question in the member chat. And of course, that's free. That's part of the benefit of being a Law of Self-Defense member. You can ask as many questions as you want for no cost at all. Only 30 cents a day to be a member, folks. A lot cheaper than $5 a question. Uh, so you might want to consider joining Law of Self-Defense at lawofselfdefense.com slash join. That's part of what we do out here at these lower tiers, Marcus, is, uh, is grift, pitch a lot of no, hey, services. No, we all do it. Um, okay, so is there anything uh, you want to put in before we, we uh, jump into the paper here? Now, what I did was I took the current version of the paper uh, from the website, uh, and this is what that looks like. And I put a link to the paper and to the book uh, in the description for the video, folks. So whether you're on YouTube or Rumble or on the Law of Self-Defense member channel, uh, if you go through the description, you'll see a link to both this article and to the book. Uh, and it, it looks very nice on the Oxford University Comparative Law Forum website. So this is what you see when you go to the link. I actually uh, copied and pasted it into a Word document so I could kind of annotate just for our purposes of our show here today. Uh, but it's, it's the same content uh, here. Let's see if I can make it a little bigger. Um, except I've highlighted some stuff and, and added some capitals uh, where I wanted to remind myself of stuff I wanted to talk about. But uh, and anything you want to mention before we dive in? No, I think the uh, I think the version that you went through must have been on like SSR, Social Science Research Network. I think so. ResearchGate. I'm assuming this is the same one. Um, and uh, I, it's pretty close to what we had previously. So please don't uh, don't hold back just because I'm here in person and we'll have a good conversation about it because I think this is a topic. I mean, as you said, the people who are self-selected group here, I mean, the people who who um, subscribe and, and, and listen to what you have to say are obviously people interested in the topic, as as am I. Um, just by way of background, I mean, I started my, and you can call me Marcus, as you know, Andrew, but uh, <laughs> yeah, I know Dr. Funk has a certain ring to it. Um, uh, but, uh, uh, you know, I started looking at this topic back in the, uh, in the, I started doing some work um, on analyzing sort of the history of the Second Amendment in the, in the mid 90s, and then started uh, working on my dissertation at Oxford, which was on self defense law. And like everything in Oxford, you know, theory is prized highly. And so there is a heavy uh, amount of, of moral philosophy theory, um, legal theory, but also doctrinal stuff. So I think, I'm, I think. You know, obviously, this is a topic that, you know, it, 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 as I always point out, is a perennial topic, uh, not one that just kind of comes and goes. It yep. peaks with cases like the Rittenhouse case and Zimmerman and so forth. But it's always out there. It's something that law students in particular find very interesting and people outside of the law find interesting. Everyone can have an opinion on on the topic. And usually, you know, their opinion is as good as the next person's, including mine. So happy to happy to have a, a conversation about this. And and like I said, I mean, the the, the critique you had of the earlier draft should be similar to what you have here because the, I didn't change much. Um, uh, although credit to you, I did uh, insert a citation to 
uh, to uh, the uh, discussion about Texas's law of defense of property, and then also um, the highly defensible property, uh, I think, nomenclature that you use. So I gave you some credit for that one. I appreciate that very much. I saw that added footnote. It was very yeah. kind of you. Uh, so really, in, in reviewing it again, first of all, I, I realized when I went back and looked at my previous critique, I actually spent two and a half hours going through the paper, which is, seems crazy to me now. Uh, but uh, uh, looking through the the current version of the paper, the, the one you mm -hmm. sent me the link to today, I, I really kind of saw three categories of things. One is, I think there were there were things I criticized in the original paper where I can see now I probably misinterpreted what what you were saying. So I'll mention those as we get to them. Uh, then there's things, um, there's some things that, that you changed, maybe in part based on our discussion over lunch. Uh, and then there's stuff that, that you didn't change, but it's obviously it's your own view. It's like how you organize those elements of self-defense. So uh, that's where I'd actually like to spend uh, the most time talking because I think it would, my, my audience hears my view of my five elements of self-defense all the time. So I think it would be helpful for them to get a, an alternative perspective from, a, from another point of view. Yeah, sure. So let me just scroll through here. I'm not going to read the whole thing. People, obviously, the link is in the description, but I just want to touch on kind of those three categories of issues is too strong a word, but but topics of conversation. Uh, one is these, uh, you start with these references to uh, Vox and New York Times and uh, some Senate testimony here uh, and New York Magazine. And for, for someone in, in my kind of gun community, we recoil when we see these resources because to us, these are all part of the kind of gun control narrative. There are people on the other side of the political uh, aisle. And I, I think what I must have done uh, when I first saw this, I assumed that you were citing these as favorable sources. I, actually, it says right here, you, you're you basically call, citing them as people who uncritically portray American self-defense law, just noting that this is how it's being communicated uh, to the general public, but not necessarily in an accurate sense. So that's that was a misreading on uh, on my part. Um, well, maybe maybe it makes sense for me to kind of on that point sort of introduce why I wrote the why I wrote this particular article. And it, and it is uh, as someone who's you know spent a lot of time thinking about the topic, uh, uh, thinking about it not just from an academic perspective. I have sort of an un, a slightly sort of unorthodox background in the sense I started in academia, then became a prosecutor, and now I'm in private practice, but still teach and have taught um, at law schools around the country, in fact, around the world, um, and do a lot on self-defense law. One of the things that kept on coming up is this perception, both in the U.S. and outside of the U.S., that the U United States has really what, what some call sort of untethered or extreme self-defense laws, laws that are far outside of the norms of the rest of the world. Now, some might say, who cares what the other people think? or what people outside the U.S. think. I do, um, as you might be able to tell also from my um, slightly nasal uh, uh, speech. Um, I, I didn't grow up in the U.S. I grew up in Germany, which is one of the reasons I look at German self-defense law. But one of the things that comes up again and again, and you just have to turn on your television, are, are statements after every tragic situation, sometimes you know justified situation, but that, wow, we have these crazy laws in the United States. And so when I went to look for examples of people who make these, as I put it, confident declarations, these are the sources that came up. Uh, you know, I personally don't shy away from looking at views that I don't always share uh, uh, ideologically or otherwise. I frankly find it it helps me. Frankly, that's why I'm here on the with you, Andrew, right today because I I thought, well, he he obviously isn't as impressed by my work as I am. And so uh, <laughs> let's talk about it. But I, I I found these examples that, and all of them basically go to that point. All of them say. In the United States, we have crazy laws. It's sort of shoot first, ask questions later. And by by implication and sometimes explicitly, the laws, particularly in Europe, are much more civilized, human, humane. Um, and, um, and what I wanted to do is meet those claims on their face. In other words, I'm not making normative judgments about what's right or wrong, although I do some of that here. What I'm saying is, as a matter of fact, right, as a matter of law, the U.S. law is, in fact, entirely within the mainstream and, and indeed is more protective of aggressors, of attackers than the laws of Europe, uh, uh, most countries in Europe. And so that was sort of the point of the article. So you're right. I, I wasn't citing um, these folks to say that they're right. In fact, I'm citing to say they're wrong. Right. Uh, they may be right, right about other things. I don't have a some strong opinion about The New York Times or Vox or any of these other other outlets. But on these particular points, 
they are, in my opinion, just factually wrong based on the, the self-defense law in the U.S. And that brings up this issue of the elements. And I understand, obviously, you've got the five elements that you've, you've um, developed. What I did is I used the elements that are in the jury instructions in, in, in the statute. So yep. because I was trying to be fairly doctrinal, say, look, this is what the law says. And this is why the law is different than what, uh, the, let's say, the Germans or the English have. And, and, and this is why it's actually more protective. I wasn't saying that it, the, the elements couldn't be organized differently. I'm just saying that that's how they're organized in, in all of the statutes and, frankly, um, all of the uh, analysis of the statute. So I kind of stuck with that. I could come up with my own, you know, seven elements or six elements, but um, I stuck with sort of what's in the actual laws. Right. And uh, it makes perfect sense. And, and frankly, one of the one of, one of the most common things I see in the law in appellate court decisions and jury instructions is the same thing that I was critical of your paper of from my perspective, and that I see these five very atomic elements, very distinct yep. elements. And it's the most common thing in the world to read an appellate court decision where they'll say, our, our state has three elements. But when you read them, they're actually conflating two or more into yep. one bucket, which, I, I mean, I guess it, it's fine, but it, 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 to my mind, it, it complicates analysis because you're you're not treating the analysis as, as discreetly as you could. But 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 we'll get to that. And and I certainly yeah. agree that it's a very bad thing to have people misunderstanding what a, the actual law of self defense is because then they're making political decisions and personal decisions in self defense using force that they think may be wise or they think may be lawful, but in fact could be very unwise and very unlawful because they're changing things they don't understand or they're using force in circumstances where they don't actually understand where the legal boundaries are. That's why we spend so much of our effort here at Law Self-Defense educating people like, like we're doing this Saturday with that class. Uh, I, you mentioned in your paper here that stand your ground is perhaps the most complicated, uh, um, not complicated. Um, controversial? Controversial. Um, facet of self-defense law in America. And that's unquestionably true. But I think it's true largely because people don't know what it means. A lot of people have been taught that stand your ground means that anybody can kill anybody else for purely subjective reasons. And when they think purely subjective reasons, they're often thinking racist reasons. So, you know, a, a white person can shoot a black person just because they don't like black people or they're scared of black people, um, which obviously would be horrific. But that's not, in fact, what stand your ground means. It means something quite different. It merely means that you're relieved of an otherwise existing duty to retreat, um, which is much more straightforward and less malicious than the misunderstanding. But of course, there's there's political uh, and sometimes financial power to be gained by misrepresenting the law. And sometimes people are doing it with the best of intentions. They just don't know. They've been mistaught. They genuinely believe the misrepresentation of the law. And, and again, that I think that that can lead people to bad public policy decisions and, and bad personal decisions in self-defense. No, agreed. I mean, one one of the you know, one of the aspects of, of all of these statements, whether it's, you know, anarchy, American self-defense law is expansive and is anarchic, uh, is that there's this received wisdom. You know, people, I think, some, and, and a lot of these people really should know better. I mean, they're not as expert as you are in the sense of having really dedicated this much time and effort to this topic, but they're trained lawyers. They're going to be on a, a national network. You'd expect that they would understand the basics, right? And this is something that drives people on both sides of the political aisle. I mean, there are a lot of people who are very pro self-defense law. And what I mean by pro, meaning a more expansive reading of self-defense law that gives the defender more uh, leeway uh, that are on both sides of the political aisle. And so I think what happens is you just, you find that, 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 that it's received wisdom. It's something that they have been told or that there's passed down uh, on some blog somewhere, and then they just, before they go on TV, they look at it for five minutes, and then they opine on, you know, what a particular factual scenario might mean in, in terms of self-defense. And, and to your point, they're almost always wrong, sometimes just a little bit wrong, sometimes totally wrong, in, including about where, you know, castle doctrine, stand your ground, those, those concepts that limit, you know, the, the, the requirement of, of retreat um, uh, uh, that, that circumscribe the requirement of retreat, um, that those will somehow give you a blank check to just start shooting. It, it, it's, uh, it does make one wonder whether it's intentional or just a, a gross negligence by the people preparing. But whenever I'm on TV, I try to at least 
get read up on it a little bit before I tell millions of, of, of viewers or listeners what the law is. I mean, frankly, it's been my experience that the, the media uh, filters for people who don't are not necessarily correct, but are are willing to talk to the narratives that the media is interested in. Uh, on either side of the narrative, because then you have a you know a, a contest, and you don't, and it's boring for the media to have some rational, well-informed person saying, "Well, actually, that's not what the law means at all. It means something else." They they prefer to have people in set positions who are antagonistic to each other. I've certainly found when I go on these shows, and I, I if I play the role of expert and try to actually explain the law, uh, I rarely get invited back a third time. Uh, because that's not really what they're interested in. They're re they're interested in good guy, bad guy, good position, bad position. Uh, and plus, you're only on for what? Most of these shows, six minutes, seven minutes. Yeah. I mean, it, there's not really, and you only get a fraction of that time because there's other people on the panel. There's not really time to explain things in a substantive way. I mean, I've begun turning down those invitations because it feels so unproductive. Uh, and so what I tend to, and that, so what what's actually happening is the, the behavior of the media is, discouraging, disincentivizing me, who's fairly expert on these issues, from being on their show. So who do they get? They get people who are less informed, uh, but are willing to talk to a particular narrative in whatever the conflict may be. And I can tell you, we just had this verdict in, uh, in Texas, the Daniel Perry murder trial, uh, which was a self-defense case where he was uh, uh, a sergeant in the army driving an Uber car, got into a confrontation with a, an armed Black Lives Matter uh, protester. Gunshots were fired by Perry. The protester was killed. And many people on my side of the political aisle just defaulted to, well, the, the BLM protester must be the bad guy here and the, the army sergeant must be the good guy. Um, but the trial's over. He's been convicted. And I did a lengthy legal analysis of that case this past Sunday on the, on the website Legal Insurrection. I'm not sure if you're familiar with that. Um, and uh, man, the heat I've been taking for the last 48 hours uh, because I, I believe the jury verdict is... I think a rational jury could have gone either way, but there was certainly enough evidence uh, for them to find guilt here. Uh, it's it's not an insane verdict. Um, and uh, <laughs> I've alienated a lot of people on the, my side of the political aisle. You know, that, that's it's, sure. it's an interesting point you bring because, I mean, I'll be the 20,000th person to talk about the balkanization of our media culture and, and, and all the bad things that brings, all of which I agree with, by the way. Uh, but to your point, you know, it is a, a, a team. Uh, it's a team effort these days. And so if you're not, you know, if you say if you voice a note of discord with your team, immediately you're not part of the team anymore. And that used to be more prevalent on one side of the political aisle than the other. Now it's on both sides of the political aisle. And what I find is a perfect example. I was on Dan Abrams show and, and I and I and I spoke on the Houston shooting in the Taqueria. Right. And my analysis it's just my analysis is that, you know, the first, you know, four to seven shots are probably unobjectionable. If you don't know which case that is, you can check it out. And in, in, in the article I wrote for Bloomberg on the on the case, I, they, they show pictures. And then the last two are pretty hard to defend, and particularly the last one. So right. what have I done? I basically agreed with the quote unquote pro gun or pro self-defense <laughs> crowd by saying the first shots are OK. And then I have I have I have um, betrayed them by saying that the last shots are OK. And the flip side is true with the anti self-defense or anti gun right. crowd. And so th as a reward for my efforts, I have, you know, thousands of comments that, you know, <laughs> hey, look at this guy is wearing see through glasses. He must be a radical liberal. Well, look at him. He's wearing his collar up. He's got to be a right winger. I mean, if he thinks he's the Fonz, I mean, you, you, you can't make anyone happy if you, but, but the fact of the matter is like life is complicated. Self-defense cases are very complicated and there isn't a clear cut answer. So while I might say we should urge caution in some cases, like in the Houston case, and then immediately the comments come, well, look at this, this, this lefty, uh, you know, he would, what if that happened to him? And then on the other hand, if I say, you know, that the first shots were okay, I'll look at this right winger. So right. to your point, I've given up trying to be on part, you know, team A or team B a long time ago. Um, and I think that's a healthy way to be. And I frankly think if more people just took the facts and looked at them and were objective, I have my priors, we all do. But, you know, I think that's a, a better way to go, which is what we're doing now. I mean, you know, yeah. we'll, we'll see where we end uh, at the end of this, but uh, we're, we're, we're talking through it in, in a normal, and it, civilized way without losing our minds. And it's the only way I know how to live. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. it would be, and it'd be a very unpleasant life if I was trying to conform my legal analysis to who, right. who, the preferences of whoever I was talking to.
Okay, so let me come down here uh, a bit more. Uh, so you're talking about distinguishing between the law. Oh, I just like this part. So you're clearly distinguishing here uh, between the law <laughs> of self-defense and gun law, uh, which yep. is something I run into all the time because the normal populace doesn't make that distinction. They, they think it's one mashup. And I actually don't do gun law at all. Gun law being, you know, magazine capacity limits and what size of a gun you can have and how many and where you can have them, because that stuff varies tremendously over the country. Even within states, it can vary from county to county. Uh, it changes all the time. Uh, I, I think it would be very difficult for any person to genuinely claim nationwide expertise on gun law. It's such a complicated area of the law. Um, but, uh, but self-defense law is much different. It's mostly the same across the states. I mean, in terms of underlying principles, obviously every state has its own statutes and court cases and jury instructions, but the, the underlying principles are largely the same. Um, so, I, but I was glad you made that distinction because I have to make it to people all the time. People, people you know, call to ask me questions about what gun they can have. I, I would have no idea. Uh, uh, see, I'll, I'll let you take credit for that. You know, I removed social justice. I saw that. Uh, it's, sort of, it's one of those terms these days. It's laden with um, political meaning beyond what I'm trying to convey. Uh, and and my my point is, if you believe, we're, even if you're totally wrong about this, by the way, if you believe our laws are bad, or we need to reform our thinking, whether it's about self defense law or gun control, um, or gun confiscation or prohibition, depending on how you look at these these terms, you still need to understand what the law is. And, and so my point is that um, that if you want to have a, a conversation about social justice in the term in the way that I mean the term, um, uh, then you need to understand the law. But as you pointed out, that has that is sort of freighted with ideology these days, much like uh, some other similar terms. I think there's one more that we'll probably discuss. Um, so I did remove that um, after after. Um, kind of thinking about it a little bit. Because again, the point here is not to make, a, this is not a political statement. It's it's a statement of law. And in fact, no, I don't think it's possible to disagree. This is gonna be my, shows how, how, how humble I am. Um, I don't think it's possible to disagree with my ultimate findings. I, I don't think anyone who is rational and reasonable can say American self-defense law is an aberrational, period. That's not a matter of opinion. It's just, that that's what the law is. And, uh, and so I didn't wanna get into, you know, distractions. Yeah. So I uh, might, I mean, this is just a passing criticism when it was in there because I, I kind of, I, I think I said at the time that anytime you put a, a prefix in front of justice, you're talking about something other than the traditional definition of justice. Uh, but I was very actually sympathetic for putting it in. So I, I, I in a previous life, I had a job doing a, a grant applications for the Harvard School of Public Health. It was during the AIDS era. And whatever grant you were writing had to include some reference to AIDS research or you wouldn't get the funding. Uh, so we would drop, we would do seagull respiratory disease and have to include an implications for AIDS, you know. Um, and I've never published in the academic literature in the law, so I don't know if that has the same kind of dynamic where the reviewers are looking for these kinds of key terms uh, for... I mean, Samson not really. I, I can tell you, though, that, I mean, any conversation about gun control that is even marginally sympathetic to the, um, the non-control perspective or the pro second member perspective is is likely and this is an, again not a statement of opinion whether that's good or bad i mean i, I have my opinion about it but um it, it, that that could hurt you in your efforts to try to get published um but i, I don't i didn't remove it because of a fear that an editor uh would not like social justice versus yeah. justice uh i highlighted affirmative defense here this is this was uh, not really a criticism of you or your paper. It's just a term that I, I don't like to use because it, it used to have one consistent meaning across the United States 100, 150 years ago. It meant that the, the, the defendant had the burden of production. He had to raise the defense in the first place. And then he had the burden of persuasion. And he also had the meaning he also had the burden to prove the defense, mm -hmm. typically by a preponderance of the evidence. And self-defense was a traditional affirmative defense. So Traditionally, when you raise self-defense, you had the burden of production and the burden of persuasion. And over the decades, they've and states one by one have changed until, until now it's all 50 with Ohio just being the last holdout just a few years ago, have changed so that self-defense has become effectively a negative element of the criminal charge. And the, the state has the burden of disproving it uh, beyond a reasonable doubt. The defendant still has the burden of production on self-defense. They have to raise the legal defense. There has to be some evidence in support of it. But once they do that now in every state, um, 
the burden shifts to the uh, to the state to disprove. Yeah, and that's why I say. I mean, I I, I described it as formally a, an affirmative defense because if you look at the literature, if you look at they still call it you know, that. They call it an affirmative yeah. defense, but I, I agree with you. I mean, as I say, once a defendant introduces evidence supporting a self defense claim, then it's up to the prosecutor to disprove it beyond a reasonable doubt, which is a which is not an easy uh, task, as I'm sure we'll discuss. Uh, let's see. Then we have these elements. Um, and just to remind people, so the, w the way I consider these elements of self-defense, and it's not the only way to do it, but this is the way I've been most comfortable, um, is with these five elements of right innocence, here. okay, <laughs> eminence, proportionality, avoidance, and reasonableness. Anybody who doesn't have this, by the way, we give it away for free at lawofselfdefense.com slash elements. It's just a PDF download. We, we don't charge a penny for it. Lawofselfdefense.com slash elements. Um, and just as brief uh, explanation, uh, the element of innocence means you were not the initial aggressor in the confrontation. So conversely, you're the person being attacked. The element of eminence means you're defending yourself against an attack either in progress or immediately about to occur, not something in the past, not something in the future. Uh, proportionality has to do with the intensity of force. Uh, and that's, of course, there's two forces involved, the attacking force and the defending force. They have to be proportional to each other. If you're only facing a non-deadly force threat, you can only use non-deadly force in self-defense. You can't use deadly force in self-defense until you're facing a deadly force threat. Uh, we have the element of avoidance, which is the one most commonly waived in American law. This is whether or not you have a legal duty to retreat before you can use deadly force in self-defense. And then the element of reasonableness, which is a weird one because to my mind, it's it's not like a co-equal to the others. It's kind of an umbrella over the others, but everything you perceive, you decide, you do in self-defense has to be both subjectively reasonable, meaning you genuinely believed it, and objectively reasonable. The belief wasn't irrational. A, a hypothetical, reasonable, and prudent person would have shared that belief. So that, that's typically how I teach those five elements. And those five elements are really all here in Marcus's list. They're just maybe in a different sequence or sometimes combined in, in, in different ways. Um, so we have here the first of these, you have the unprovoked attack. And I think you added unprovoked in this from the previous one. Yeah, I mean, um, and the reason I added is unlawful attack, right? If, it, right? if it's if it's a provoked attack, then it's it's not a lawful attack. It's an unlawful attack, right? I mean, in other words, rather, if I'm the one who provoked the attack, then the return force is not unlawful. So right. it was built in, but just yep. for, for the purposes of clarity, I, uh, I added unprovoked. Right. And so one of the ways, I mean, this is just a, a rhetorical device, but one of the ways I like talking about innocence is less in the context of um, an attack than in a not attack. So you're, you have the element of innocence if you're not the attacker and you didn't provoke the other person uh, into being the yeah, attacker. I, I, agree to, I agree with that. Um, I know in, the, in your book, you, you talk about how you can essentially restore your right to self-defense. In other right. words, I can provoke you, I shouldn't have. You can attack me. I can withdraw and, right. and essentially neutralize my attack, and then I can redeploy defensive force. It's not in the elements. It is in the book, in your book. But uh, I agree. I'm not so sure it has to be a physical attack. By the way, I think uh, you know, depending on where you are, you can have uh, attacks that are not a physical attack. You can have verbal attack, insults, things like that, that will allow you to defend yourself. Not with deadly force. But you can defend yourself uh, depending on the circumstances. You can make verbal threats, for example, uh, that appear to be um, combined with, you know, behavior. Uh, so I mean, it, right. it gets more complicated. But I get it. The five elements is a is a is a summary. Um, yeah. So so and I and I I wouldn't expect your your paper to go into this level of detail, but just for this conversation. Uh, so the way the law requires the physical portion of. The, the, a portion of the attack has to be something physical. It ha there has to be some overt act. Literally, words alone are not enough. So if someone is standing still, they're not approaching, they're not apparently reaching for a weapon, they're doing nothing but talking to you. Mean words alone cannot justify the use of defensive force. But what they can do is reduce the amount of physical act you need to right. see to almost nothing. Uh, so if someone says, I'm going to shoot you, and they move their hand to their waistband, you don't have right. to wait to see a gun. The, the combination of the words and that overt physical act is sufficient to create a, a reason. I guess my, my point there would be sort of using the elements. That's not an initial physical aggressor. I mean, it's a verbal aggressor who makes a small physical movement. I mean, that might be semantic, but in the real world, I think it, there are big differences. And also, obviously, in some states, it has to be an unlawful provocation, right? For example, Wisconsin, Rittenhouse. In, in Rittenhouse's case, the, the his uh, purported attack 
had to, in other words, by by pointing the weapon or otherwise in uh, anything else he did or carrying the weapon had to be unlawful under Wisconsin law. Whereas uh, in, in uh, Georgia, where we have the Arbery case, there is no requirement of unlawful unlawfulness of the provocation. It just has to, you know, um, exceed what a normal person would, uh, uh, an ordinary person would be able to resist. Okay, so Again, we have- very nuanced, but yep. it's always a little more complicated. So we have that elephant of innocence here. I'm gonna skip past the second bullet point and, and go to the others and we'll come back to it. So then we have object of reasonableness, which of course is, is one of my elements. I just combine it with subject of mm -hmm. reasonableness to have a two faceted uh, reasonableness element. We have then timing imminence. That's just the same as my element of imminence. Uh, and then I, you, you have as a separate paragraph proportionality, yeah. but it's the same thing I'm talking about when I'm talking about proportionality. There's additional conditions that have to be met before you can use deadly force and self-defense. Um, and then let's circle back. So you describe this as necessity and you have your the subjective reasonableness requirement there. Uh, you use the term necessary, which is just a variant of uh, necessity, having no option but to resort to the defensive force. And this is very common. Uh, in court decisions and in literature. There's nothing wrong with describing it this way. Uh, the, reason, the reason I don't is because necessity feels more, um, more, it feels like it's combining distinct things, like it's combining avoidance, it's combining subjective reasonableness. It's, um, and in a sense, I mean, in a sense, it's nothing's really necessary. I mean, th there are people who would would rather die than take a human life, right? So they would say, well, it's not necessary for me to kill. I'd, I'd rather die than do that. Or or rape is not as serious as death. So I should be willing to be raped before I would kill uh, my attempted rapist. So th the, the term necessity begins to feel wishy-washy to me, be like hyper subjective. Um, whereas if, if we, in, in my mind, it's cleaner just to say, if there existed an imminent threat of death, um, you're justified. If, if, if the five elements are checked off uh, the way I have them defined, um, th then you have a legal privilege to use deadly force and self-defense. And, and, and the door closes to someone saying, well, you should have just taken the rape. Well, it doesn't matter what you think I should have taken the rape. It matters that I was facing an imminent threat of death or serious bodily harm. Yeah. And I think, I mean, th this gets us into kind of what I said at the outset, where there are ways of of viewing this disentangling or aggregating it in some sense is necessity incorporates everything. You could certainly ima imagine it that right. way. It'd be one element, yep. you know, uh, defense. Um, and on the on the on the rape argument, Fiona Leverick has that view that that's never enough. Um, and and so I what I'm doing is I'm just going with what the the jury instructions say because again my point the point I'm trying to make here is that our law is not different from the laws of other countries uh, is not extreme. And I'm not, I, so I need to stick with the law as it is, not as I think it could be or might be. Sure. And just one thing on, not to turn the tables here, that's not my uh, desire, but on proportionality, one thing I noticed in, in your five elements, and you just said it again, is you can only use deadly force to, to thwart deadly force. And I would, I would disagree just because, as, and I think you know this, that, it, and as I say there, you know, you can also use deadly force to fight off great bodily injury. So if someone's going to cut off my hand or my finger, even though I know it's not going to kill me, I can still kill them if, if that's the only way I can prevent that injury. Right, right, right. And so also, just, to, just to clarify, when I say deadly force, I don't mean death. I mean death or serious bodily injury. So it, okay. it's, it's one okay. compressed category. Yep. Got it. Um, okay. So let's see. What else did I highlight here? I, I, I skipped over much of the, uh, the German stuff and the oh, English stuff. I, I, I don't. I, I just, I, I don't know the law and I don't have time to research it. Uh, I'm happy to come back to it, uh, but let me just l hit the little highlighted sections here, uh, the sure. stuff I'd criticize, because I want to make sure I give you an opportunity to speak to that. So one thing I had criticized was you, you reference, um, oh no, this is just, I wanted the audience to see this, that the, the way that the German law varied, that it permitted the use of deadly force under a broader array of circumstances than would be acceptable in the U.S., we can circle back to this. This I had been a little critical of because you referenced here some very old law. Mm -hmm. um, and during this period, of course, there had been dramatic changes in the form of government uh, in Germany. Um, and it wasn't clear to me that we wouldn't have seen dramatic changes in these laws, right? So we have a, a 1923 reference. I think Hitler came to power in 1933, and then we have 1935. And of course, then Germany lost a war, and now we have modern Germany. Um, so I wasn't clear to me how how 
that we should assume these would be representative of what German law looks like today? Yeah, I mean, two two points on that. One is later in the article, I, I cite to a, a 1920s uh, U.S. case, I think a Georgia case, uh, that says that you you should never be able to use deadly force to defend prop, mere property, right. right? So it juxtaposes the German concept at the time, which is basically the right need never yield to the wrong. That comes from a famous German case. In other words, hey, this is the legal order. You've got to comply with the order. And if we start letting people just kind of, oh, it's not such a big crime. Let them steal a little bit here. Let them beat you up there. If we start letting people get away with an inch, they'll take a yard. So we need to be pretty strict about if someone violates the law and it infringes on your rights, you have a right to defend that, even if it's a match. Now, and a lot of people in America would like that to be the law here. They I love mean, it. I hear about it all the time. Yeah. And, and Robert Schopp at the University of Nebraska, very, very pro prominent scholar, very renowned scholar, for those who want to nerd out on this topic a little bit, he uh, he has written a, about self-defense law, not recently, but but he has a view that is more aggressive in the sense of would allow deadly force and, and, and like, much like Germany would. I personally find it very difficult to defend that for a number of reasons having to do with my own analysis, right? This is where I have my own seven values of self-defense law that I sure. think should be um, the law, but I'm but I'm aware that they're not the law. So I'm not, you know, that that's a separate thing. And then it is true that the, obviously Germany, that's one of the reasons as a German, I'm very suspicious of government power, right? I, I, I may be hardwired. Now you could say, look at Germany today and say, well, people seemingly have forgotten that in the sense that, you know, it's still a, a heavy government influence over people's lives. I happen to have a, a, a fairly, even though I was with the DOJ for 10 years, I'm, I'm skeptical of government power and don't think it should be untethered. And so, you know, it, it is true that this this was obviously a historically important period in Germany, but the law didn't change that much until basically sort of the 60s, 70s. That's when the German scholars started saying, wait a minute. And I say scholars because in Germany, actually, the view, the majority view, Hashen der Meinung, is really important to, to, to judicial decisions, unlike in the, in the United States, where you might see a Supreme Court case that makes a little passing reference to a law review article in, in Germany. The majority view is very influential and the majority view should start shifting away. Um, but as I say later, even today, the, the, there's no hard and fast rule on this. But if someone steals your laptop, let's say, you can still use deadly force to defend it, which you could never do in the United States. So while the precise contours of German self-defense law changed over time and obviously changed during the World War II and after World War II, um, the big picture hasn't changed, which is in America, not in 1920, not in 1970, not in 2023. Can you use deadly force to defend mere property other than in Texas at night right. in your home? <laughs> right. Which, you know, and then and then uh, in the U.S., um, I mean, in Germany, on the other hand, in 1923 and 1823 and in 2023, you could use deadly force to defend property. What changed were the circumstances a little bit like is it, you know, how much how much value does the property have? And is the person taking the property a guilty, morally guilty person, or is it, let's say, a child or defend, or, or someone operating, you know, has, who has mental health issues? Right. Uh, that that changes the calculus. Also, family member, uh, you have less right to use deadly force to defend, let's say, property if it's a family member who takes it, because you owe a greater um, uh, uh, duty uh, of of essentially to to sort of take the hit uh, if a family member takes your stuff as opposed to a stranger. Uh, but but again, directionally, I think the point is still good, which is in the 20s, America said no deadly force defensive property. And Germany said total defensive force and defensive property. And today, with, again, almost 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 like almost arcane difference in Texas, it's still the rule in America that you can't use deadly force to defend property alone. So and it's interesting. I like that. Right. I could I, I don't luckily for me see the comments, but people could be now saying, <laughs> oh, look at this wacky guy. You should be able to defend property, but that look. I, I'm sorry. That's go to your legislature, right? Don't come to Andrew or me. Go to your legislature and try to get them to change the law because right. No I, I have to tell. Law. I have to tell people all the time. Listen, you, you may wish you lived in a world or in a state where you were privileged to use deadly force in defense of property, but you don't. Uh, you know, change the law. I mean, I personally, I don't know. It's I, I'm sympathetic to both points of view. I personally would never kill anybody over a piece of property. I could care less. Uh, you know, I tell people all the time, I, I have a very traditional home. All the bedrooms are on the second floor. If I hear someone stealing stuff from the first floor of my house, 
they can steal whatever they want until the cops show up. I'm not going down there. There's nothing down there I'm willing to get killed over. There's nothing down there I'm willing to kill somebody over. Uh, they can't come upstairs. That'll get loud and flashy. Uh, but I'm not, I'm not going to kill anybody over a piece of property. But I'm sympathetic to people who say, listen, I, I, I worked hard for this property. They're stealing maybe years of my effort. I can't pay my mortgage if they steal my work truck with all the tools in it. Um, it's a very sympathetic argument, but I can only tell people what the law actually is. And, you know, it's curious, defense of property law is actually, when I said earlier, self-defense law is fairly common, consistent across the 50 states. That's true. But defense of property law really is not. Um, I mean, we have this weird exception for Texas that does have a provision for the use of deadly force in defense of mere personal property, even in the absence of a threat to persons. As you know, it has a lot of conditions and a lot of hoops. And if you don't jump through them, you don't qualify. And then you've just killed somebody without a legal justification, which is not a good place to be. Uh, so I discourage people even in Texas from attempting to take advantage of that statutory provision. But it exists. So I have to note it. But even in states that only allow non-deadly force, you in defense of property, you'd think it would be very liberal, but it's often quite constrained. Um, often it's only force uh, that's your property. So not mm -hmm. a woman who cries out that her purse has just been snatched or it's force. You can only use even mere non-deadly force if the property is being taken from your possession or you're in the immediate pursuit of recovery of the property. If you see the guy with it the next day, you can't use any degree of force to recover it. There's one state, I think it's Ohio, that sets up this complicated familiar relationship scheme mm -hmm. where they say, well, you can use non-deadly force in defense of your property or that of your parents and your siblings and your brothers and your second cousins, but not like your uncles or aunts. And who, who the heck is going to remember these relationships in the heat of the moment when a piece of property is taken? Uh, no, I agree. Gets, uh, I, just two comments on that. I mean, one, I think people who are sitting at home, you know, perhaps on their couch thinking that, boy, you know, if someone steals my stuff, I'm going to blow them away. You know, that view may change if it's their kid who's, you know, 17 and stealing some other kid's bike or being a dummy and breaking a, you know, a light or, or, or a mailbox, right? They, their view that, you know, you should be able to use deadly force to defend your property no matter what it is, often I think will change if it's their kid who's dead uh, on the ground because they, you know, took a baseball bat to a, to a mailbox or something like that. So that's one. And the other one is, I mean, this goes kind of back to what we started with. I mean, I recently was listening to Fox and 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 they're telling, you know, the commentators saying uh, relating to that case in Arizona uh, uh, that you can use deadly force in Arizona uh, to prevent a trespass. Right. <laughs> I mean, first of all, it's, it couldn't be more incorrect. It's not a question of opinion. Right. It's a question of law. That person is wrong. And secondly, that person has a huge following and they're probably as a result of that factually incorrect statement that has not been retracted. There are probably, you know, thousands of people wandering around the earth now thinking that you can just blow people away who are trespassing without yeah. more. And and that just goes to show how dangerous it is when amateurs, you know, kind of involve themselves and make statements of fact, pr proclamations of law to their followers. Yeah, I often say in, in analogous to uh, Reagan's famous uh, quip, but it's not so much that people don't know self-defense laws that most of what they know is wrong. Mm -hmm. It's garbage, but they think it's true. The most common remark I get from clients on cases I consult on is they can't believe they're getting prosecuted for self-defense because they legitimately believe that what they did was lawful self-defense. They had no idea what they were doing was arguably unlawful. Yeah. Well, that's why I think, and this isn't like my little pitch for Dan Abrams, but I mean, I think Dan, that his show is great because it's so even-handed. And, and, I, and I think even my kind of few minutes on it show that he looks at both sides and makes arguments in both directions. I think we need more of that in our discourse, in our public discourse, and less of the tribal sort of, you know, my the Hatfields and McCoys analysis that we that, that is frankly uh, polluting the airwaves these days. You know, I, I do find interesting, you, if I understood you correctly, in, in Germany, one of the one of the variables they would look at might be the value of the property. Mm -hmm. Uh, because that would address what I think is a gaping hole in American law, because I, I think it makes a difference if you're stealing a tradesman's work truck and you're really going to debilitate his ability to support his family, maybe keep his home versus if you're stealing someone's backyard barbecue. Uh, yeah. You know, th those are two quite different things. Well, and there's even an open question in, in German analysis on whether the person taking the thing needs to know the subjective value. In other words, if I have a stamp that's objectively worth 50 bucks, but it is a valuable stamp that my great grandfather gave me on my birthday mm. or whatever. 
and and he knows that without that stamp, I'm I'm going to be so sad. I mean, I could probably think of better examples than a stamp, but that one just came sure. came into mind. Um, uh, there is an open question of whether you should be judged by the objective value or what you understand to be the subjective value of the thing. So, I mean, again, this goes, and we talked about this in American self-defense textbooks, right? I have a couple behind me here or, or criminal law textbooks. There's a section on self-defense. It might be five pages, maybe 10 max, right? So criminal law student learning about self-defense has five, 10 pages, something like that. Not if they, they have right, your book, right? right? Maybe. They have your book, they'll, they'll learn more, but, right. um, or if they have my book, they'll learn more in a different way. Um, in Germany, if you're a, a criminal lawyer, a criminal law student, you get your criminal treatises, there'll be, I, I counted it, I went through like 10 of them and just got an average of about 200 to 250 pages. But that's the length of the whole textbook in the US about criminal law. 200 right. to 250 pages just about self-defense law. So it's extremely heavy on the values that the defense law is trying to prevent, protect. Why is the society we should have it? Under what circumstances self-defense is or should be justified? It's 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 pretty heavy. It's a, it's pretty stout analysis um, that I've never seen anywhere else. Yeah. So we uh, I mean, people are always shocked, lay people, when I tell them, uh, granted, I went to law school a long time ago. Maybe it's different now. But uh, in, in my first year of criminal law class, we spent maybe a, a small fraction of one class talking about criminal law, maybe yeah. 10 or 15 minutes. And, and that was it. And that's representative of a lot of attorneys. They just we're not really, really taught this stuff. We get a little taste of it in law school. And one of the things we did years ago at Law Self-Defense, because we work with a lot of self-defense instructors, people who are teaching people how to shoot and so forth. And their knowledge of self-defense laws is as bad as anybody's because they, they don't have good sources of information to go to. So we developed uh, what I call our Law Self-Defense Instructor Program. It's, a, it's a, like a 15 hour, 16 hour course of instruction on self-defense law and things like how to, how to read a, a appellate court decision so you can understand the law yourself moving forward. Uh, how the courts actually work, how decisions are made and so forth. Uh, but I really designed it conceptually as a semester long class in self-defense law. If there were a law school that taught such a thing, I'm, I'm not aware of anybody who does. Um, but we tried to, we try to teach it at a, at a law school level. If such a thing existed at the law school level. Yeah. Okay. Let me uh, go further. Let's see. Uh, a defender is nef never authorized to intentionally kill an attacker solely for the purpose of protecting property. We covered this a lot already. And you do make a reference somewhere here. And I know it's in the footnotes to Texas yeah. Penal Code 9.42. By the way, if anyone wants to read that, it comes up so often. I have a little shortcut URL, lawofselfdefense.com slash 942. We'll, we'll pull up the statute. Read it for yourself. Note all the hoops. Note all the references to reasonable. <laughs> Because every one of those is a point of attack by a prosecutor. Uh, let's see. Um, oh, here's a reference to me. So you talk about defensive property, castle doctrine, and in some cases, in some circles, uh, your home, workplace, or vehicle referred to as highly defensible property. Footnote 50. Footnote 50 is me, folks. <laughs> Very kind of you. Yeah, Marcus. I like that term, highly defensible property, because it really... <laughs> It's not just property. It's, there's a little bit more to it, right? Um, yeah. Uh, the idea being that you're particularly vulnerable, or that you you know you're in a particularly vulnerable environment, like in your home, where you have greater defensible property. But that, that I think it's linked to greater danger, right? I mean, you're more. Well, it, it's really the house, idea that hotel so like a, a generalized duty to retreat is is theoretically because there presumably there's a my view of it is that presumably there's a safer place for you to go to. Uh, and if you can do that consistent with safety, you should do that before you take a human life. But when you're in your home, you're already in the safest possible place. There's, there's no safer point of retreat after that. Uh, and that's traditionally how castle doctrine has been described. Uh, but it's and then a lot of states create these special provisions, these legal presumptions that you had a reasonable fear of deadly force harm if someone's breaking into your home forcibly and unlawfully breaking into your home. Um, but what what you're defending there is not really the home. It's not your doorknob or the shingles on the house. The, the structure is acting as a surrogate for the people inside that are being sheltered by that home or workplace. For example, a vehicle is highly defensible property only when it's occupied. If it's an unoccupied vehicle, it's merely personal property. So it's not the physical aspects of the car. It's the people inside the car that, that make the difference. That's exactly right. That's that's why I see that linkage. There, there is a you know there. That's why I don't think of it as pure defense property. It's there's a it's self part of that property. 
Uh, and that, that pretty much gets us uh, to the end. Just some mm -hmm. conclusory statements from you here. Many readers will be surprised that England and Germany uh, reject categorical requirements that a defender either avoid conflict or retreat. So this is the retreat issue, that they don't impose a generalized legal duty to retreat. No, nothing special about America in that yep. regard. I mean, stand your ground is not a crazy invention by some wacky American legislators. It's, in fact, the law in most countries around the world. And uh, in the final analysis, impactful misconceptions about U.S. self-defense law distract us from having a more fully informed debate about the appropriate role and justification for self-defense in a modern democratic nation. Correcting such fallacies then is a vital step first towards a more balanced and promising conversations about the extent to which we should reform our laws governing the use of deadly force in a pluralistic society like ourselves. And with that, I could not agree more. Regardless of one's position, you can't have a coherent discussion and debate uh, and consensus on the outcome unless people are speaking intelligently uh, ab about the subject matter, uh, using the same terms of arts in similar ways. Um, it, otherwise, people are effectively speaking different languages, even if they're both speaking English, and, and you get nothing but, but a morass at the end. All right, Marcus, I know you're a busy guy. We're right at the top of the hour. Do you have time to stay for a, a few questions that I would yeah, like to pick? Yeah, I sure do. Okay, we'll, see so, how, we'll see how kind they are towards me. <laughs> uh, well, at least on YouTube, we make them pay. So uh, I'll, let me pull, let's check out the, actually, let me go to my members first. Uh, Steve Gosney has a question. Steve Gosney, by the way, is a fellow attorney. He's a, uh, a public defender down in Florida, a very, very smart guy. He's, he's published a couple of his own books. Uh, you can find, people can learn more about that at stevegosney.com and, and a personal friend of mine. So a very, very nice guy. Um, where are you? Where did it start? Oh, but I got to get to your question, Steve. I wasn't quite at the top. Uh, oh, here he is. Steve Gosney comments, good academics welcome thoughtful criticism beca because it makes the work better. Yeah, of course. And uh, But it's surprisingly rare. <laughs> I mean, yeah, lawyers okay. and academics yeah. are very often very thin-skinned in my experience. So it's yeah, such they, a pleasure they, to meet you, Marcus. I, I agree that they're, they're oftentimes thin-skinned and they oftentimes de de devolve into, and I think that's the best way to put it, into their own you know, Balkan, balkanized factions that are on team this or team that, and it's uh, it's a shame. Okay, another question from Steve Gosney. He says, in the Old West and in rural areas, property protects life, and theft of that property is a matter of life and death. Now, I guess he may be referring to things like if you steal a man's horse, you could be right. hung for that. Um, now, with a wealthy society, we seem to diminish the right to property in the phrase life, liberty, and property, is this not a position, a first world view? I mean, I think, yeah, you can view it that way. It's an interesting take uh, that Steve has. I'll also comment, I mean, this is part of the big, uh, one of the ongoing debates right now in the criminal law is, are white collar defendants treated too leniently? You know, you can you can steal, you know, a hundred million dollars and, and, and destroy people's lives. I mean, if you think about your own bank account just being wiped out, it destroys your life. There's a real open question, right? If, if I'm a baker, I go to work every day for 20 years, 30 years, so I can get enough money to get my kids to college. And I keep all that money, you know, in a, in a, in a bank or in a, in a safe deposit box. And, uh, and then someone steals it. I would probably rat and I, I hate my job. Let's assume I love baking, but maybe other people don't, um, they do it professionally. So, would I rather have, you know, my, my hand cut off than, than, than lose all that my life savings? I think the answer almost most people, all people are going to give, most people are going to give is yes. In other words, in that case, your money really is an extension of your life. I mean, it, it is right. your life, which is what the German law is, is, is tethered to. So I think in, in the U.S. now, to get back to Steve's question, you know, we have real debates about the sentencing guidelines. Should we give harsher sentences to people who are white collar criminals? You know, you, you rob a bank or you steal some, you, you deal crack and, and you, you're looking at major jail time, particularly if you have priors, um, whereas a lot of white collar defendants are, are perceived to get off relatively easily. And uh, and so, yeah, I think, you know, you can view it as a, you know, a first world problem or a pro the kind of problem we have when, when money is the currency, uh, I don't mean that literally, but figuratively, and where physical labor is, is, is less um, you know, is less a way of means of, 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 of getting food. I mean, I grew up in a farming family, um, you know, where, where uh, your ability to work 
uh, and and what you had in your house actually was what you what you had. It wasn't in a bank account necessarily. Right. Uh, Stephen here asks a question. Uh, if I'm overlanding in my vehicle, I guess overlanding means like RVing. Maybe Stephen's from uh, a foreign nation. Um, living out of it uh, via food, gear, sometimes sleeping in it or next to it in a tent, can I protect me and my vehicle from harm, theft? So uh, I don't know. If you're not in the U.S., I don't have a useful answer for you, Stephen. But in the U.S., it's much like the car analogy I was talking about. When your RV or trailer or whatever is parked in storage, it's just personal property. When you're using it to live out of, that becomes your castle. That's your home while you're living in it. becomes highly defensible property. But the, 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 the state of the object, of, of the RV or the trailer, changes depending on the manner of use. Yeah, I agree completely. And frankly, you, you need to look no further than, for example, homeless encampments. Uh, there are a lot of cases where law enforcement you know, basically knocks over a bunch of, you know, um, well, ha half the time, I mean, you can almost say cardboard boxes, and then finds drugs, and the argument is they should have gotten a search warrant because this is the person's home. They treat it as their home. Same logic. Right. It, it certainly would be for use of force purposes. So if you're yeah. camping out in a tent in the woods, that that tent is your castle while you're while you're living out of it, just as your home would be. Uh, let's see, YouTube uh, super chat five dollars. Wow, thank you very much. Says no real questions. Just wanted to say thank you, Doctor Funk, for the adult, reasonable discussion of this topic. Indeed, indeed, I would second that. Uh, let me go over to Rumble. We might have a question there. We do. A. Let me change this up so we don't need this on the screen. Don't hold back, there. Andrew. I mean, if you don't have to, you don't have to choose the nice ones. You can choose the mean ones. That's no, okay. these are all. Oh, these are the ones who paid. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm only reading the ones who paid. I'm not even. I don't I'm even look afraid. at the ones that don't have money tied to them. Um, uh, Twenty five dollars. That's a that's a big one. Uh, I think they call those rumble rants. Thank you, Marcus, for coming on to talk. You mentioned that you have a seven element breakdown of self defense. Instead, what what are they? What are they different from those listed in your paper and Andrews? I can pull that paper back up, and maybe you can just sure. Kind of... And I can go over. I mean, it's almost like a planted question, Andrew. I mean, I really this is not a planted question, um, but I really appreciate the question. I mean, my and I'll I'll try to make it very quick by my standards. In the U.S., the argument is usually, should we protect people who are defending themselves or the attackers? And that's sort of a, a bifurcated, a, you know, binary decision. It's either protecting the person defending himself or the person attacking that person. My, my thought is that in, in order to really think about when we should allow self-defense, we should think about a broader set of values. And specifically, the seven values I have, and, and you could, I haven't really found a whole lot of argument that there should be others, but there probably are others that should be included, or maybe I'm looking at them the wrong way. This goes back to the, should it be five elements or six or whatever? This right. is my personal sort of summary. And number one is reducing overall societal violence through the monopoly of force, right? That is kind of, sounds controversial, isn't as controversial as you think, like, you know, moral philosophers, political philosophers, uh, particularly um, sort of on what we today call the conventional political left, will say the, co the government is what should be defending you, not you. And, and do so, I recall seeing those in this book? Yeah, that's, yeah the, okay. that's the cornerstone of that book, which is number one, one of the values is that by and large, we, we want to defer to government power versus individual power as a, as a default presumption. Number two is protecting an attacker's presumptive uh, uh, right to life. In other words, if even a person attacking someone in a fight or otherwise, you know, you want to, you want to protect them to the extent that the law can. Again, people will say, oh, that scumbag deserved to die. That may be your personal moral philosophy. That is not what the law requires. And that's another value that I think the law should seek to protect. The third is maintaining equal standing. That's my favorite one. You know, you think to yourself, what is it about being robbed? People who have been robbed or, or had their house broken into feel violated in a very unique way. And the reason is that their equal standing was violated in the public sphere. In other words, my, I have a right to, to, to have not be victimized. And by someone victimizing me, they're disrespecting my equal standing. Much like if I always use this analogy, if you're in a car and you get cut off on the median, I don't know about you, it really irritates me uh, when people do that or when people cut in line. It may not actually slow me down much. It may have no effect on me, but it, 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 it really irritates me when someone pushes ahead of me in line. And why? Because they're violating my equal standing. They're disrespecting me. So that's another. And when someone attacks someone, that's the difference between a culpable attack and a and a non-culpable attack if let's use property if it's a rainy day 
I grab an umbrella out of out of out of a, a stack of umbrellas. I put my umbrella in there. I think it's mine. It turns out I accidentally took someone else's umbrella. That other pe person suffered a harm, right? They lost an umbrella, but they weren't wronged. They were not disrespected. I was not intentionally taking something from them. The difference is, I go to the restaurant. I come out. It's raining. I don't have an umbrella. I just grab someone else's. Now I've wronged that person. Right. And so that's the difference. And that's where the equal standing comes in. Um, protecting a defender's autonomy. Of course, that's the big one for people, maybe a lot of your listeners. They say the people who think that you should be able to kill someone for stealing your bicycle, right? Um, I'm not saying that's all your listeners. I'm saying I'm not. No, no, I understand. People, Don't worry. But, uh, uh, that's a lot of them. <laughs> the, like Robert Shop, right? The professor in Nebraska. Again, one of the very, very prominent guy. And I think you should all check him out, particularly if this is an area where you might agree with him. He would say that protecting the uh, the the indivisible and un, uncompensatable uh, uh, autonomy of the individual is number one. So the concept that you shouldn't have to suffer harm just to pr protect someone else, um, that would fall into that category of, of trying to protect the, the, the defender's autonomy. And I have uh, uh, three more. One is ensuring the primacy of the legal system. It's a little related to the first one, uh, monopoly of force, which is all the other things being equal, we want to resolve things in court, not on the streets. So that's why, like in most cases, property theft, you, you, we would prefer you go to court and sue right. the person and not shoot the person when you know who the person is who's stealing your stuff. The, the, the sixth and, uh, is maintaining the legal uh, order. That's a big one, right? That is, in these days, in particular, there are a lot of people, a lot of groups of, uh, in America who do not... Um, uh, who do not protect, pr respect uh, the judicial system. They think it's biased. They think it's unfair. They think it's unhinged. And that goes on both political sides, by the way. Yeah. Both and by the way, there's a lot of truth <laughs> to, to those views, depending well, on I your mean, perspective. Look, I mean, my, my point there is we don't want to have self-defense outcomes that cause people to more have even more disrespect for the law, right. have even more disrespect for the judicial, the, the judicial process, our justice system. And then finally, deterrence. Seventh value is deterrence, preventing people from committing crimes because they know if they commit a crime and someone's going to be allowed to use self-defense to defend themselves and also their property, maybe not deadly force for property, but they can use, you know, force to defend their property. So those are the seven values. My argument is in each case, we should think about those seven values and see which ones factor in and which ones don't. In some cases, you know, if you have an innocent attacker, someone who's maybe a, a delusional, right, they're not wronging you. They don't even know what they're doing. Um, uh, they, they don't, it doesn't invoke all of the seven values. So that's my kind of pitch. And it's more to people drafting self-defense laws. Uh, and that's what the book talks about a lot is, look, we have a lot of these complicated theoretical questions of self-defense. I like to think we can answer them all uh, by looking at, uh, kind of analyzing it through my prism. And I'm not saying these are the only seven values that matter or that they are uh, uh, perfectly organized, but I haven't seen a better set. And only there's a guy named Boaz Sangaro. He's a uh, he is a an academic. He's come up with a list of three values that should be considered. So he should be credited. And the German law talks about values. I just think we need to think about self-defense as what values are we trying to protect in each particular case and then apply those standards, those seven values and see which ones apply, which ones apply more in one case versus another. And that's a more rational way. You have a language. We have a shared dialogue, a, sh a shared vernacular in which to discuss self-defense cases, as opposed to just, I'm right, you're wrong, scumbag deserves to die, no person has a right to life. I mean, it, it, it's not much of an, a debate. It's just a, it's like a, it's, it, it's a binary decision on off. And, uh, and that's not how self-defense works and nor should it. And, and I have not an opportunity to think deeply about those categories you just described, but just listening to you talk about them, there's, there's definitely parallels just in, in the lay community on some of them. I mean, the last one you described, uh, much of my community would, would refer to as the F around find out doctrine. <laughs> you know, uh, sure, you can, you can try to take that property, but there's going to be consequences and you may not like the consequences, right? That's part of the deterrence. Uh, another one you mentioned was the kind of the shaming Mm -hmm. facet. It's it's a different kind of offense when there's shame involved. And uh, in the in the there's people who study the human dynamics of violence, and they often refer to that as the educational beatdown, uh, where within a community, uh, someone's breaking the rules, someone's flirting with someone else's gr girlfriend, or whatever they may be doing that's considered inappropriate by the local rules of that community. And some dude will step out and smack them. 
and knock him down. Now, it's not a vicious beating. It's not sustained. They're not trying to kill him. They're not trying to take his stuff. They're just teaching him a lesson, getting him back in line. And no one, if, if it's limited to that scope, no one steps in to help the guy who's getting smacked around because they accept he's getting an educational beatdown. Now, that, that smacking around is not lawful <laughs> under use of force laws. It's still an unlawful battery. That person smacking him around wasn't defending himself. Uh, but it's a very it's a it's as it's probably more concrete uh, a law of human interaction within that community than than anything in my book. Yeah, I mean, I think I, I, obviously I, I'm not so sure about the, the educational beatdown and what how good of an idea that is. But I think that concept of, of, of maintaining respect for the legal order, in other words, and this is true. Look, whether I was a prosecutor back in Chicago or, or, or what with what I do now. You know, for laws to work, for a justice system to work, people have to believe in it. Yeah, you can have an authoritarian justice system like Germany had or like Italy had or like China has, where you use force to uh, cause people to comply. But you have to use a lot of force and it's not a respected system. And as soon as the smallest crack develops, the whole system falls apart. A, 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 a system that's appropriate for a democratic nation like ours is one that where we try to maximize the the buy-in that people have. So even if people in, in, in prison who committed murder are going to say murder should be illegal, right? There are not a lot of people other than psychopaths who think rape, murder, assault should be okay. Right. Uh, and so even the criminals, if even people in prison could sit together and they'd come up with a set of laws that are not that different from ours. Now, maybe the educational beatdown would be part of their law. It may not be part of mine, but... Um, but I think that is a big one, not the yielding results that cause society to disrespect the law uh, is part of the consideration we should have when we think about the results. It shouldn't be. A, it's not a popularity context. You know, you know, our laws are not are not voted on. Right. Nor right. should they be in the sense. And I mean, the outcome. So you don't you, know, you ask 12 jurors what they think. Yeah, I get that. But you don't just say to the public, hey, what do you think? Should we hang people publicly who engage in certain offenses, most people would say yes, and then we hang them. Right. That's not the way our system works, thank God. And but, we don't uh, decide jurors to decide, we don't ask jurors to decide what the law is. Exactly right. Right, They're we, given they the law. We interpret the facts and apply, and then the judge applies the law, but they re render decisions of fact, not of law. Yeah, it's, I mean, of course, one of the difficulties of modern America is how polarized we've gotten. And I, I certainly don't want to turn the conversation political. In fact, I, I want to wrap it up in just a couple of minutes so, sure. so you're free to go. But I know there's many people on my side of the political aisle who watch these prosecutors in these urban centers just releasing prisoners or not enforcing property theft offenses or, or you know, just preferentially, uh, not in the traditional sense of, you know, there's always resource allocation decisions, but basically saying, uh, no, we're, we're just property under $1,000. We're just not going to prosecute it. Blanket, blanket as, as a matter of social policy. Uh, and they lose confidence. The, the observers of this lose confidence in the criminal justice system because their stuff's getting stolen. Uh, and nobody cares. I mean, the cops won't even take a call because there's no point arresting the person. They won't be prosecuted. Well, I mean, you, you only have to look at my migration patterns within cities to to see um, uh, to, to see a very graphic illustration of what you're saying. We're talking about the tax base, right? right. People pay the taxes. Uh, if they feel that they're um, they're not protected, they leave the city. They leave Chicago, for example. Um, and likewise, when I was in Kosovo, one of our big focus points was how do we make sure that the rule of law works well here because companies are not going to invest in this place, which is a wonderful country, by the way, with wonderful people. But people had a negative perception of how the rule of law worked there. And until you know that your property is protected, you're protected, the justice system works fairly, people are not going to invest in your country, in your city, in your county. And so we're seeing it in America today. We've seen it internationally. The cornerstone of any functioning society is functioning rule of law. Right. And once we have that, then everything else follows. Without that, everything else falls apart, which is why, maybe good wrap up time, but why I think law of self-defense, right? Self-defense itself is the most fundamental, arguably the first civil right. It's been described as an ancient right. One of the pre-legal pre, pre rights that existed long before someone wrote them all down. Uh, that is the starting point. And there are a lot of other laws, obviously, we need to figure out how to how to make work. But uh, but without respect for the law in all quarters of society, rich, poor, all demographics, you know, you can't please everyone. But to get as many people on board, that is how we are going to get 
to where we want to be as a society. And that, I think, is the only way. All right. With that, I think, Marcus, thank you so much for coming on the show. This is uh, what you see up on the screen there is Dr. Funk's book, Rethinking Self-Defense. That link there at the bottom will just redirect you to Amazon where the book is. It's a very good book, folks, from what I've seen flipping through it. So if you have the kind of interest in self-defense law that I, I expect you have if you're here in this community, I would urge you to go take a look. You can look at some of the pages on the inside on Amazon, check out the reviews and all that. Certainly, uh, I would encourage you to take a look at that. Uh, Marcus, thank you so much for coming on. I can't tell you how much value it adds to my community to have you here doing that. And uh, I, I really, really appreciate it. Yeah, thanks, Andrew. Thanks, guys. Appreciate the uh, the attention. And, and let's keep on working at it. All right, Marcus. We'll talk soon. Take care. Bye-bye. All right, folks. So that is pretty much the show, except I'm going to remind everybody, I'm going to remind everybody that we have our upcoming Law of Self-Defense Advanced class this Saturday. Four days left, folks. Full day course teaches you how to be hard to convict an unattractive target for prosecution if you're ever compelled to use force in defense of yourself, your family, your property. Four days left. This is the only one of these we have scheduled for this year. If you miss it, you're looking to next year. Can you wait that long? When are you going to have to defend yourself? Do you know? Is it up to you? By the way, if you have a conflict, scheduling conflict for Saturday, I would encourage you to register anyway. We're going to make the playback, the recorded playback of the course available to all the registered students. So you'll be able to access it over the course of the rest of the week or whatever. Learn more about the Law of Self-Defense Advanced course and register, please, at lawofselfdefense.com slash advanced. And with that, folks, I will remind all of you that if you carry a gun for self-defense, that's why I carry a gun for self-defense, to make sure I'm hard to kill, make sure my family is hard to kill, then you also owe it to yourself and your family to make sure you know the law so you're hard to convict as well. Until we meet again, I remain attorney Andrew Branker for Law of Self-Defense. Stay safe. 